Good morning, Guyer fam. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today, whether you're joining us online or you're here in person. Right now, I am standing in the children's lobby. I wanna let you know that we have some construction happening right now, and we wanna let you know that you can still access this point. We just wanna apologize for the inconvenience. It'll be the next few weeks we'll be working on this. But we also wanna tell you some other things that are coming up in the life of our church. Here are a few announcements for you. Be sure to mark your calendar on October 30th, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at our Raymar Fields. We're gonna be having a harvest festival. It's a family-friendly event featuring games, candy, food, and more. There'll be prizes for the best costumes, but please, nothing too scary. We also could use your help. If you'd like to bring some candy, you can drop it off at the North Lobby, or perhaps you'd like to help us volunteer. You can sign up at gsfbc.org slash Raymar Harvest Festival. Okay, parents, listen up. This one's for you. On November 12th, 6.30 to 9.30, we're gonna have a parents' night out. Here's what you need to do. You need to sign up at gsfbc.org slash children. The deadline for that is November 1st. So if you need a night out, this is your chance. Remember, once again, here at Geyer Springs, our mission is to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. Now, let's worship together. Welcome to Gar Springs First Baptist Church. Let me open us up by reading from Psalms 103. It says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Good morning, Gar fam. Name. Thank you so much for joining Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Remember this right here. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's wings. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. And this morning, we get to come in here and we get to worship together. And I want to welcome you. If you are a guest here today, if this is not your home church or you just kind of happen in here or you're view viewing us online, I want to ask you to grab your phones and text DISCOVER to 94000. So that's 94000. And if you're a regular attender in here and this is your church home, we would like you to do this as well. So get out your phone, text 90 or text GSFBC to 94000. And what that's going to do is going to help us connect with you and get you to that next step or whatever it is that you want to connect with. We have the information for you. And so if that's you, go ahead and just take out your phone. It's, it's not every day that you get to take out your phone and like text something. And so this is, this is where we applaud that. We're like, yes, do that. So if that's you, go ahead and do that for us. We also had this announcement just come in hot off the press. If you want to join our hospitality team, if you like to greet people, if you are uh, really good at hosting, or if you're just a friendly person and you're ready to use your gift, hey, right after the service today, Please meet Jason Miller right here in this area, and he'll get you some more information about that. Uh, last announcement. Today, you can see we got some youthful people right behind us. And so let's give it up for our very own Larry, uh, last name, Grayson. Grayson's going to come up here. I'm still new. I can totally make that mistake, right? Larry Grayson, who's one of our own, but he's also the chairman of worship at OBU. Y'all get up. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. I have not gotten to be, this is my church, and I've not gotten to be here since August of 2020. Yeah, 2020. And so I'm glad they got, that we're here today because I get to come to my church. And if you are a guest here, this is a great church. You need to be a part of it. So I would encourage that. Uh, I left the convention, Arkansas Baptist State Convention, and have been serving now as the chair of worship studies at Washita. And uh, part of that is getting to work with fantastic students like this. Uh, and they are leading worship. This is Washita Worship. Uh, this is the travel team for Washita Worship, and they have done a great job of leading leading in churches throughout our state. I love them and love to travel with them and love their hearts. I wish you could know them individually like I do. Um, 
but I hope you'll take my word for it, that they are uh, God-led students who really serve well. Uh, of all these students, this is Chloe Humphrey's home church, and so I think, you know, we're glad that Chloe's a part of this. And of all days for Chloe to be struggling with her voice this morning, we're just praying God's going to just, and it's going to work for her today. But she will still do a beautiful job for us, so we're excited about that. Thank you for hosting us today. If you might have any question about Washita, I'm proud to be a part of that, of, of that faculty, about Washita and what we do there or how students get involved with that. Ashley Giles is over here on the side. She's an admissions counselor from, uh, that serves this area, and she'll be right down here afterwards. Come say hey to her. Ask her questions. Students, ask her questions. That'll be great. Okay, enough of that. Had to do that advertisement. Um, let's pray together, and then let's let Washita Worship lead us in worship today. God, I love you today. I thank you so much for the privilege to be in Geyer Springs First Baptist Church today. God, I'm honored that I get to be at my church and uh, get to be led by these students, get to hear Pastor Dave. God, I just pray that everything that's done today will bring you honor and glory. God, it's not about us, those of us on the platform. It's not about uh, Pastor Dave. It's not about any of us today. It's all about you, and I pray that you will be honored and glorified by what comes from our lips, but also what comes from our hearts. Uh, we praise you for salvation, for mercy, for grace, for love. Thank you, God. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to open up this time of worship just reading some scripture over you guys. So I'm going to read from uh, Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Why don't everybody stand and join us in worship this morning.
creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing His evidence His name would burst from sea and sky Then from rivers to the mountain tops We'd hear Christ be magnified Stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway Into resurrection life if I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you where you rise. And we are returning glory with all the angels and the saints. My heart will still be singing, my soul will be the same. Sing it all, Christ be magnified. have this morning to continue in worship. You see, the church is not a building. We didn't come here to a building uh, for church. We are the church, 
As we gather and as we sing songs, we know that we do this in adoration of the one who is worthy, and that is Jesus. And as we sing together and we continue in song, we know that this time is going to end, right? This time of our Sunday morning service of worship will end, and then we'll have to, we'll have to go out. And the rest of the week, we will spend our lives in worship of hopefully the Father and hopefully of Jesus and hopefully in spirit. And, and there's ways that we do that at work, uh, at school, or sometimes during lunch meetings or just our, our everyday occurrences. Um, but one of the cool things that we get an opportunity to do here at Guy Springs, we get to leverage our resources that God has blessed us with. And one of the resources that God has blessed us with is this Raymar Field, right? And y'all probably have seen it if you're driving out towards Bryant, there's this Bryant Parkway, you take it, and on the opposite side of the interstate, there's this, this beautiful open field, it's got a playground now, and it's got this, uh, this house is being remodeled, and we're thinking about, man, how can we leverage this resource that God has blessed us with in order that more people might know and worship Jesus? Well, this last 11 weeks, we had a great opportunity to see over 200 participants, like players and coaches, in our upward football and cheerleading. And over the last 11 weeks, what are we doing? We're developing relationships. We're, we're going out. We're meeting people outside of this Sunday worship so that we can develop relationships for the purpose of sharing the gospel so that they might become a worshiper of Jesus. Well, in this next season, we're not done, right? We, we got this Raymar Harvest Festival, and if you've probably been hearing announcements about this, what is this? This is an outreach ministry of Geyer Springs so that we can develop relationships with people in the community so that we can share the gospel and they can become a worshiper of Jesus. You see, all of this is, is built towards us to respond to the one who is worthy, and that is Jesus and Jesus alone. And so this morning, we get to do this on a Sunday morning, but it doesn't get to stop here. It gets to go to Monday, to Tuesday, to Wednesday, to Thursday, to Friday, and to Saturday, and then we're back here. And when we come here together as the church, the church, not at church, the church, we get to pause and we get to think about this and we communicate to the one who is the authenticator of our faith, that is Jesus through prayer. And that's what I want to do. I, I, want to, I want to thank God for what he's done in the past, but I'm also going to thank God for what he's going to do in the future because our church is still moving, it's still living, it's still breathing, it's still active. And I want y'all to join with me in prayer this morning as we do that because God's not done. Y'all believe that? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time on a Sunday morning where we can come and we can gather as the church and we can lift up these songs of praise, of worship, because you alone deserve praise and worship. So many people around us, they worship other things that are not worthy. And they fall short of where praise is supposed to go. And so we pray that we wouldn't be a, a person pointing back and saying, shame on you for doing those things. We pray that we'd be a church that would be living and active and seeking those and engaging in re relationships so that they may know the one who is worthy of praise. So as you use this time this morning, as you use our people this morning, would you just revitalize us? Would you encourage us? Would, would you do what you even said in Psalm 103? Would you revive us in our youth so that when we leave this place today, we leave in your spirit, we leave in your courage, we leave in your boldness, so that even on October 30th in a, in a harvest festival where we're just opening up our fields, would you bring people that need relationship with you and would you use our people to share the gospel truth that you have come? Not only did you come, but you have come to redeem us, to save us, to give us new life. And God, that's our prayer. That's what we desire. We desire to see our region change because of your goodness. And we desire to see our lives change because of your goodness. So Spirit, would you just teach us today through your word? Father, would you correct us and bring us into repentance where we need it? And Jesus, would you redeem those that are here even today that do not yet you know, know you? so that we might worship you today, tomorrow, the next day, to the ends of our days here on earth and forever and ever and ever in eternity.
a real place called heaven. Amen. If you would like to stand, you can stand. I thought we were going to have a message, but we're not. <laughs> so y'all can feel free to stand if you want, if you want to sit, feel free. If you want to kneel on the altar, then feel free to come and kneel and pray. Just use this time to, uh, to worship the Lord. When your people gather
sing holy, holy, holy with me?
Trinity. Blessed Trinity, you are the blessed Trinity. Lord, we just want to We have gathered today, and as best we know how, we have come before you. We have worshiped you, your holiness. And Father, as a, as a holy God and as a people who come before you, we recognize that you have called us to be holy. And so we ask today as we come to a time of looking into your word, of hearing from you, we ask Holy Spirit who authored this book that you would take the truths and help us apply them to our lives so that we can be the holy people that God has called us to be. And so his holiness might be proclaimed through all the earth and especially where you've placed us. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite your attention this morning to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. By the way, if you came in this morning here in the worship center and you don't have a Bible, there's a copy of the New Testament uh, there in the, uh, the back of the pew in front of you. You will need a microscope to read it, but uh, hopefully you'll find it helpful if you're in the venue. They're on a table in the back. Feel free to uh, pick that up. Feel free to take it with you when you leave this morning. Well, we're in a series called Foundations. We have made clear the foundations of our faith come from God's Word. Not from the Southern Baptist Convention, not from traditions, uh, not from the uh, thoughts or the teaching of men. Uh, weeks one and two, we, uh, we covered bibliology, the study of God's word. We said the Bible is God's inspired word. Every word, not just the thoughts, but every word in the Bible was given by God to the 40 men who penned it. And God's word, like God, does not change. And so our foundations, our foundational truth, our core belief never changes. And God has given us in his word all the instruction we need to recognize our need for him, to come into relationship with him, to know how to live for him in this life, and know what it will be like to live for him, with him for all of eternity. I saw a bumper sticker this week that I thought was certainly appropriate for where we are. It said, you want to hear God speak? Read the Bible. You want to hear him speak out loud? Read the Bible out loud. It'd be good for a lot of TV preachers to take that advice, I think. Well, this week we spent two weeks on, uh, on bibliology, last week on theology. God didn't write about himself because he wanted to pen an autobiography. God wrote about himself so that we could know him. He's made himself knowable. Uh, all of us have the opportunity to know God, but it's important to remember that we have to know God as he has revealed himself. We don't know God from the opinions that, that men have because man's opinion can be woefully inadequate or, or just flat wrong. You know, there are a lot of people in our culture today, in our country especially, that say that they believe in God, but their, their lives reveal that they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They don't believe in the true and living God. So we know God, we know about God from his word, and that is the most important knowledge that any human being can pursue, and that's the knowledge of the true and living God. And so this morning, uh, we go to Christology. We look at the second person of the Trinity as we ask the question, who is Jesus? And again, we look to God's word for the answers. Now, we mentioned um, the first week that the main thing of the theme of the Bible is redemption. So as the Redeemer, Jesus is the primary subject of the Bible. All of the Old Testament points to the coming of Jesus. The Gospels tell us about his life, the account of his life on earth, and then the epistles and revelation remind us and reveal to us the fact that he is coming again and they prepare us for his coming. All right, John chapter one, let's look at verses one through three as a starting point this morning. It's interesting that while Matthew and Luke started with the birth of Jesus, John backs up way before that. Here's what he says in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and that refers to Jesus. Jesus is the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so what you see in verses 1 and 2, you see this phrase, in the beginning. That tells us that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He was preexistent. 
In the beginning was God, the Word, and the Word was with God. John is telling us that Jesus was present with the Father before the creation of the world. Jesus is not a created being, and there are a lot of groups that teach that, that Jesus was a Son of God, that he was created by God. Jesus was not a created being. He existed with God from the very beginning. In fact, in John 17, where you see Jesus praying before his arrest, one of his requests in his prayer is this, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you, listen, before the world began. Jesus was with God before the world began. There was never a time that Jesus did not exist, and there will never be a time when he will not exist. Notice John also mentions in verse 3 of chapter 1 that Jesus is the agent of creation. He says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Paul in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17 tells us that he is before all things. What does that mean? It means Jesus is preeminent. And preeminent is more than being in first place. Preeminent is being so far out front that there's not even a second place in sight. He is before all things, Paul says, and he holds all things together. He sustains creation. The only reason our world doesn't blow apart on any given day is because Jesus is sustaining creation. Jesus, Paul said, is holding it all together. And, and like we said of God last week, of the Father, Jesus is imminent. He is involved, he was involved in creation, and he continues to be involved in creation even today. He's involved in our world. His imminent and, and personal involvement in creation, John speaks to in the same chapter, chapter 1, look down at verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then skip on down to verse 18 while we're here in John 1. No one has ever seen God, that refers to the Father. The only God, that refers to Jesus, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And so Jesus, John says, became flesh, he dwelt among us, and because Jesus came, we're able to know the Father. How do we know the Father? Because he came in human form. The word is incarnation, it's from the Latin, it means to make into flesh or to embody in flesh. And so what John is saying here is that Jesus, who is God, came and he was wrapped in flesh so that we could see God, so we could know God in terms that we could understand. This transcendent being that is beyond anything we could comprehend sent Jesus. Jesus was God. He came so we could know God. Jesus told the disciples in John 14, verse 9, they were asking about seeing the Father, and he said, guys, you've been with me so long. Don't you get it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus came to be the representation of God for us. He, he made the universe, and then he came to save his own creation. And that is, that is distinctive in the Christian faith. And that's a very important truth for us to hang on to, the fact that God came and lived among us. Literally, studying the language, it, you, you could say it this way, Jesus came and pitched his tent among us. You ever been camping? I'm not talking about you people I have the big fancy travel trailers and RVs. You ever been camping? You go camping, especially with other people, and man, you're, you're right there in the middle of it. When you, when you pitch your tent, you're not expecting any real privacy because everything can be heard, right? That's what he's saying. Jesus came, and he was right there in the middle of us. Why? Because Jesus becoming a man enabled us to know God. The transcendent God reached down and extended his hand of grace to us. Let's talk about how Jesus came. We know his birth was not ordinary. We know his birth was not like any other birth. There's never been another birth like it. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born to the Virgin Mary. And that's an important doctrine because it's essential to our faith. Jesus came and, and lived and had human flesh, but he was not conceived by a human earthly father. Now, because there's never been another birth like that, that's, that's difficult for us to comprehend, but his birth affirms the Word of God because of its supernatural nature. John Dagg, a, a respected Southern Baptist theologian of the 19th century, wrote this way, the divine power which formed man out of the dust of the ground could also form a man in the womb of a virgin. We don't have to understand it. We just accept it. 
It's what the Word of God, God tells us. Jesus was born of a human mother, and his ordinary birth from a human mother affirms his human nature. Jesus becoming a man enabled him, enabled us to know God, it also enabled him to identify with us. You see evidence all through the Gospels in the accounts of Jesus' life. You see evidence of his human nature, and, and it tells you that he can identify with us in our human nature. Luke 2.40 mentions that as a child, Jesus grew and became strong. Luke 2.42, he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Matthew 4.2 tells us he became hungry after a fast. Matthew 4.6, he was weary after a journey. John 19.28, while on the cross, Jesus said, I thirst. Over and over and over in the gospel accounts, you see evidence of his humanity, and that tells you that he identifies with us. He experienced all the things that we have or that we will experience. Another evidence of his humanity is the fact that when Jesus rose from the dead, he had a physical body, a human body. Now, that body at that point, once he rose from the dead, was no longer subject to weakness or disease or death, but in his resurrected body, the disciples were able to see and touch the scars and the wounds from the cross, from his sacrifice. In Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus said to them, see my hands and feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, listen, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So he was definitely in a human body, in a human form with a human nature. But he was different from us in one key way. Jesus never sinned. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 describes Jesus as him who knew no sin. Peter in 1 Peter 2.22 tells us that Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. John in John, uh, 1 John 1.3 1, and verse 5, in him there is no sin. And then Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus, being a man, allowed him to be our sacrifice because only a human could make sacrifice for the sin of mankind. But as a human, Jesus lived a perfectly obedient life because a sinless sacrifice requires a perfectly obedient life. So he was a man who could sacrifice for us as men, but he lived a perfectly sinless life so he had the right to be the sinless sacrifice and take on the sin of all mankind. Now remember though that even though he was a man, he was not born as all the rest of us as humans. He was born of a virgin. Why is that and, and why is that important? Let me, let me mention three verses to you and then clarify it for you. In Romans chapter five, verse 12, Paul says, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, that was Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans chapter five, verse 19, Paul says, for us, for as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Again, that man was Adam. By Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, what do those verses tell us? First of all, we have all descended from Adam. I mean, that's pretty simple. You can go home and trace it back, but it's pretty simple to know we've all descended from Adam. And because we've descended from Adam, we have inherited sin. We were born in sin, and as a result, all of us became sinners. Now, that sin gene, that inherited sin, that sin gene, our inherited sin, is carried through Adam. Sorry, men, we can't say it was the woman, okay? God's word is clear, that sin gene is carried through Adam. Now, that helps us understand why God had Jesus come and be born of a virgin. It's because the seed of Adam was not passed down to Jesus, so while he was completely human, he was not born in sin. His birth was miraculous. It was a supernatural work of God. It fulfilled prophetic messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, and it confirms the reliability of Scripture. He was born of a virgin. He was fully man, but he was also fully God. 
Jesus literally had two natures. When he became a man, when he came in human form, he didn't cease to be God. He didn't give up the nature of being God. He gave up the privilege. He gave up the rights. He didn't exercise those things for himself, but he still was clearly God. And the word teaches us of his deity that was present in his humanity. Paul in Colossians chapter 1 verse 19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In whom? In the incarnate Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So Jesus still was fully God even in his human form. You know, in John 8, and this is one of those encounters with the Pharisees in John 8, Jesus proclaims himself as the I am. You recognize that name? That goes back to the Old Testament in Exodus 3.14 when Moses said, well, who am I going to tell him sent me? Tell him I am that I am sent you. So Jesus in John 8, in saying that his name was I am, is making clear that he was claiming to be God. And it happens frequently throughout the Gospels where Jesus claims to be God and it leads to charges of blasphemy and, and plotting to kill him. And that's exactly what happened in John 8. They began to think, how can we get rid of this guy? But Jesus was making clear while he was in a human body and was fully man that he was also fully God. And so the Christ, the eternal Son of God, took on a fully human nature. He had both a divine nature and a human nature. Those two natures were totally distinct from each other. Each nature retained its, its own properties. Now, in case I've lost you, let me, let me be clear on the significance of his two natures and why that's important to us and our faith. First of all, let's talk about Christ being perfectly human. Man sinned. And so a man had to pay the penalty for sin. Christ as a man was sinless and he had to be sinless in order to atone for our sin. And the fact that Christ had a human nature makes it clear that he can understand our trials and be a perfect example. When, when you read about the example of Christ, of, of his love and his patience and his humility and his, his triumph over temptation and his holy living, and, and you read all that and you say to yourself, well, I could never live like that. No, you're wrong. Jesus lived like that with a human nature and a human body. He can identify with us. And then secondly, Christ had to be God because that sacrifice had to be of infinite value. Jesus on the cross literally took on the sin of all mankind, past, present, and future. It was a huge sacrifice, and as God, his sacrifice had infinite value. Jesus also had to be God to represent God to men. We know God because of Jesus. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus had to be God and human so he could do what Paul referred to in 1 Timothy 2.5. He said, there's one mediator between God and men. You see, Jesus' two natures made it possible because it was God, he could represent God to men. Because he was a man, he can represent man to God. That's why his two natures are so vital. You know, Scripture not only tells us of his miraculous birth, his incarnation, his divine nature, his human nature, but we also know that he lived life on this earth in a very limited human body while retaining that nature of being God. And all of that happened so that when he shed his blood in his substitutionary death on the cross, you and I could be redeemed from our sin. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 20, 9, 22 said it this way, indeed under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. What does that mean? Well, you know the Old Testament law, because of their sin, the Israelites, the Jewish people had to offer a sacrifice for their sin. It was a blood sacrifice, but Jesus was the final sacrifice. Under the law, everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So Jesus was the final one whose blood was shed to pay for our sin. It's only in his human nature that Jesus could provide the sacrifice as a perfect man. It's only in his divine nature that he could confirm the sufficiency of the sacrifice by what? By being raised from the dead. Only Jesus with both human and divine natures can be our mediator because he can represent God to us and us to God. And we know that he's ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us even now. And only Jesus is going to return in power. 
the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the, the righteous judge of all the world, Jesus. So he lived in that human body. We also know from the accounts of the gospels, here are the details we know about the crucifixion from the gospels. Jesus suffered much for our sacrifice even before he got to the cross. He's arrested like a common thief. All the disciples abandon him. He was put on trial three different times in a short number of hours, and every single trial violated the Jewish law. He was severely mistreated, beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable. Not just unrecognizable as Jesus, but to the degree that he did not even look like a human being. He was beaten so badly. He was humiliated by those he died for. While he was on the cross, they mocked him and they, they ridiculed him as he hung there. He suffered tremendous shame, embarrassment. He bore the sins of all mankind. And worst of all, for Jesus on the cross, he was forsaken by God. God turned his back on him because he had my sin and your sin on him. And a holy God could not even look on that. There's some who think he was not God. Just a man, a prophet, good teacher, maybe a, a harmless or deluded lunatic. But the Bible tells us Jesus proved he had power over sin, death, and the grave because Jesus rose from the grave. His death was not the end. The resurrection proved his claims. Listen, the resurrection proves the claims of Scripture and of our faith. Unequivocally, it proves it. And Jesus was resurrected by his own power. You know, you think about Lazarus, or you think about Jairus' daughter, you think about the, the son of the widow of Nain. Those, those people, Jesus raised them, but they were not resurrected. They were resuscitated. They died again. Sometime later, after Jesus restored their life, they died again. They were resuscitated. Jesus was resurrected never to die again, and he was resurrected by his own power. And lest there be any doubt, it was a bodily resurrection. He was seen by many witnesses. He was touched, and, and the wounds from the cross were visible in his human body. Why is that doctrine important to us? Because if you're a believer, if you're a Christ follower, if you've committed your life to Christ, his bodily resurrection means that those who are in him will experience a bodily resurrection. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Thessalonians were, were concerned. They were new believers, and they had been told that, that Jesus would be coming again. That church got established after Jesus had, had died and resurrected and ascended, and, and they were concerned because some in their church had begun to die. Well, what's going to happen? These people who died, they're not going to experience the return of Christ. And Paul said, no, 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 listen. At the sound of the archangel, at the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are still alive will join them to meet Christ in the air. Okay, it's not going to be these little Casper the ghost people and us with a body. We're all going to have a body. That's what he said. We've already mentioned that Jesus is in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for us. The Gospels of, of Mark and Luke and, and the book of Acts report his ascension. But let me mention, and, and we haven't covered all the doctrines of Christology, let me mention one final doctrine this morning. It, I'm not saying it's the most important, that's why I saved it till last, but it's definitely the most pressing doctrine. That is this, Jesus will return. Over 380 times in the New Testament, it mentions the return of Jesus. He's not returning as a helpless babe. He's not returning as a humble lamb to be led to the slaughter. He is returning in power and glory. And when he returns, first he's going to claim his church. Who's his church? It's those, it's, Adam said earlier, it's not a building. It's the people of God. It's the body of Christ. It's people who've given their life to Christ as Lord and Savior. That's his church. 
It's not people who attend church. It's not people who've been in that water. It's not people who might read their Bible or pray sometimes. It's people who have given their life to Christ, completely surrendered their life to Christ as Lord and Savior. That's his church. And he's coming. He's going to complete his mission. He's going to bring the world to its conclusion, its consummation. He's going to judge the world, and he will be revealed as the king of kings and lord of lords, even to those who have never believed that's who he was. It's king of kings and lord of lords. And the Bible says when that happens, every knee will bow. Every knee. You know what Paul says in Philippians when he says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess? He says every knee of those who are in heaven, that's the angels, the angelic beings, the saints, those already there, they're already worshiping. We ain't got a clue what worship is compared to what they do every day, every hour, every minute. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Those who are in heaven, those who are on the earth, those who are still here, listen, even those who are under the earth. You know what that refers to? That refers to Satan and his demons and all the people who rejected him in this life and are going to spend eternity in hell. Every one of them, if not willingly, they will be forced into submission to bow and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me close, and you may want to look at this passage later. Let me close with 2 Peter 3, 8 through 14. Here's what Peter writes. I'm going to paraphrase here. He tells us the Lord is coming. Now, for those who are impatient, think he's forgotten, he says, look, God's patiently waiting to give others the opportunity to repent. And, and honestly, he's waiting on us to tell others how to repent. But he says, when he does come, it will be sudden and many will not be prepared. When Jesus comes on that day, on the day of the Lord, the heavens will pass away with a roar, the heavenly bodies will dissolve and be burned up, the earth will be destroyed. Can you imagine what that's going to be like to see the heaven literally roll up like a scroll, to see the stars, all the heavenly bodies burn and just dissolve? And the earth will be destroyed, which we don't care because guess what, we get a new heaven and a new earth. Now listen to this, knowing what is coming, what kind of people should we be? And he answers the question for us, we should be living lives of holiness and godliness. As we wait for his coming, we should be diligent to live in such a way that he finds us, he's speaking to the church, he finds us without spot, or blemish. Listen, all the doctrines of Christ are important, but this one is pressing. Jesus is coming. Are you prepared? Let's bow together. We need to take a few moments Reflect on the word of God, not, not my words. I've given you the scripture, the words of God. We need to have a moment to ask the spirit of God who authored this book, the spirit of God who indwells every one of us, what, what are you saying to me? If you're here this morning and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, not you know about Jesus, not you've heard stories about Jesus. If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, if there's never been a time in your life when you surrendered, you recognize that Jesus sacrificed for your sin while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And you asked him not only to forgive your sin, you not only received his atonement, his substitutionary death for your sin, but you also said, Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sin and I, and I choose you, I make you the Lord of my life. Doesn't mean you'll live perfectly, but it means with all of your heart and all of your life to the best of your ability, under his control, the spirit who indwells every believer, you will live to please and to honor him every day of your life. 
you've never made that decision, that's where it starts. And while I'm speaking and in a few moments, when we have a song of response, there'll be pastors available for you if that's where you are. Many of you here in this room, many of you gathered in the venue, many of you watching online already know Christ as Savior and Lord. Maybe you just need an encouraging reminder of who Jesus is. He's not just a man, he's not just a good teacher. He's the eternal Son of God. And he came so that you could know God. He came so that you could know how to live a victorious life, to know that you can overcome sin. Maybe it's an encouragement to some of you who have lost a loved one in recent days to be reminded that there's a glorious resurrection coming. I think for all of us who know Christ, even though we know Christ, even though we're prepared in the sense that we have a relationship with him, we need to ask the question about how we're living knowing he could return at any time. And what what do we want him to find us doing? What state do we want him to find us in? What has the Holy Spirit said this morning? And how do you need to respond or to obey him? Just a moment, we'll close. As Washtenaw Worship leads us in a song of response. There are pastors here at the front. They're at the front of every section on the front pew. Right now while I'm speaking or as we stand to sing, you you can slip down and if you need to know Christ, you can tell them that and they'll tell you how you can know Christ. They can't force you, make the decision for you, but they can tell you how you can have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you just need someone to pray with. Maybe you need to talk to a pastor about some struggle you're going through. Maybe you need to just come and kneel at this altar. This altar's open. You can come at any time and kneel. You can make a decision right where you're seated, but sometimes there's something very significant about walking down and and meeting God at this altar. But we don't come just to hear something from the Bible. God did not write the Bible as an autobiography. He wrote it so that we could know him. He wrote it so we could understand what he's called us to as his people. We must respond. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the clarity of your word. And Father, I pray as your people, you would help us respond to what you've had to say. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you guys for, hang on, there we go. Thank you, Washtenaw Worship. Uh, listen, you guys are welcome back anytime and we'll think about Larry. Well, he is our living hope. Let's go out and live like we have a living hope and help those who need to know a living hope. Make your way to Bible study. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us online at Geyer Springs today. We want to connect with you. If you're a guest, we invite you to text DISCOVER to 94000. You'll get a text back from us with a link to information about who we are and how we can connect with you. If you're a regular attender, we invite you to text GSFBC to 94000. You can give us prayer requests, stay connected with what's happening at Geyer Springs. Our mission at Geyer Springs is to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. In our community ministries, we do that through school partnerships and our Upward Sports Ministry. To learn more about those, please visit gsfbc.org slash missions.